Okay, thank you for bearing with that. I now have a new pen. Uh, so this is the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. I'm sorry if this isn't particularly visible in this old pen. So this is the inner leaflet of the phospho... Oh dear, this is just going to go awfully wrong. This is the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and it faces the cytoplasm. So this is a very energetically favorable thing to create because basically you have all these uh, hydrophobic tails interacting with each other because they're facing each other, okay? And they interact favorably with one another because they're all non-polar. They all have this e equal distribution of charge. Uh, so they all interact very favorably together. Whereas the polar heads here, which I'll draw in pinks, uh, they face out towards the cytoplasm and the extracellular uh, fluid where there is water. So there's no water in this hydrophobic core. This is a core consisting of a lipid molecules, basically. So this is the hydrophobic core. Okay? Hydrophobic core. Uh, whereas uh, the, there is water in the cytoplasm and there is water in the extracellular space. So uh, they're going to be interacting with these water molecules which are also polar. So it's very energetically favorable to form one of these phospholipid bilayers where the hydrophobic tails are all isolated away from water and they're all together in this hydrophobic core and the uh, polar heads of the phospholipids face out and guard uh, the uh, the, uh, well, the hydrophobic tails against the water coming at it from the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. Right, okay, so if you want to uh, create a protein that's going to uh, sit in this phospholipid bilayer, you can create uh, hydrophobic uh, structures on it which are going to implant into this hydrophobic core and that will associate it with the membrane of the cell. So let me show you such um, hydrophobic molecules that you can add on to proteins. So uh, the two uh, which are um, relevant to um, well relevant to NOS free are myristic acid, myristic acid, sorry, myristic acid, okay, and palmitic acid. And I'll show you the structures of these palmitic acid. These are effectively fatty acids. When I wrote fatty acids before, these were what I'm talking about. Fatty acids. These are long-chain carboxylic acids. And these are completely and utterly saturated. They don't have a single double bond. So let me show you their structure. So we'll begin with myrist, uh, myristic acid. Okay, so myristic acid, let's say this is the carboxylic acid group here. Myristic acid is a 14 carbon carboxylic acid. So because I don't want to have to draw out 14 carbons, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a methylene group there. I'm going to put brackets around it. Okay, and I'm going to write 12 there. So that denotes that you repeat this 12 times. So that's a nice trick uh, to get you out of a lot of work. And then right at the end, we'll put the methyl group. Okay, so we've got this carbon and this carbon. Those That makes two carbons. Then we've got these 12 carbons in the methylene groups in the middle. So overall, we've got a 14 carbon uh, carboxylic acid there. Okay, so that's myristic acid. Myristic acid. Okay, uh, now... Um, I should say that myristic acid is the old name for it. It's the name that biochemists use. Uh, if you're a chemist, you'd probably use something like um, maybe um, tetradecanoic uh, acid maybe now, or um, yes, tetradecanoic um, tetra acid. But myristic acid is still pervasive in biochemistry, so we'll use that. Again, palmitic acid uh, is the old name. Uh, for the 16 carbon carboxylic acid. So this will again um, use this trick. So this time we've got methylene groups and we'll need 14 methylene groups this time. And then finally this methyl group on the end. So that will overall give us a 16 carbon carboxylic acid. 14 here, 15, 16. Okay, right. Uh, so these are two carboxylic acids that have a very long tail, basically, and the 
tail is completely saturated. So that's a good word. Saturated means that there is not a single double bond between any of these carbons here. They are all singly bonded. It means effectively that the amount of hydrogen that this molecule has is the utter maximum amount it could possibly have. You cannot find another way of adding a hydrogen uh, onto uh, this structure, basically. That's why it's said to be saturated. It's got as much hydrogen as it possibly can have. Okay, right. So, uh, what does this have to do with our NOS3? Well, let's draw out our NOS3 enzyme again. So don't worry, I won't go over the structure as in-depth as we did last time. We'll just draw it like so. So we have these two oxygenase domains here with these two reductase domains like this. So this is our homodimer of NOS3 proteins here. Okay, and remember I told you that the amino terminus was uh, at the end of this oxygenase domain here. Okay, so let me just colour it in to remind us of the colours. Okay, so the oxygenase domain we... Um, coloured in blue before, and the reductase domain uh, we uh, coloured in red. Okay, so this was a, um, this was a nitric oxide synthase free enzyme, or a NOS free enzyme. So this was NOS free. Right, so how are we going to target NOS free to the membrane of the uh, endothelial cells? Well, what we can do is we can add myristic acid and palmitic acid uh, molecules onto this protein. Uh, we can basically uh, bind the carboxylic acid group to the R groups of certain amino acids, basically. Okay, so that's what you do. You add palmitic acid groups and myristic acid groups off of uh, these proteins. So I'll draw these like so. So we're going to stick them near the amino terminus, basically. So I will put them like here, so I'll just denote them by squiggles. Okay, so we're going to add these um, long chain carboxylic acids or fatty acid molecules, and they're not quite that many, but um, I, I mean they're not, I, I might, maybe I've over put too many carbons in those squiggles, uh, but what these are supposed to represent are these long chain carboxylic acids, these are meant to represent the long tail basically. Okay, and uh, the process of adding palmitic acid and myristic acid groups onto uh, this uh, protein, onto a protein, well, any protein, in fact, are known as myristoylation. Myristoylation, okay, myristoylation, and palmitoylation. Palmitoylation, which are quite difficult words to pronounce. Palmitoylation and myristoylation. Now. Uh, Basically, you are then said to have other terminology, just to get the nomenclature all there. Uh, you are then said to have myristoyl groups. So this is said to be a myristoyl group or a palmitoyl group. So if you add on a myristic acid group onto a protein, it's then said to have myristoyl groups. And if you add on a palmitic acid um, group onto a protein, it's then said to have palmitoyl groups. Okay, so myristoyl groups and palmitoyl groups. And they are added on through the process of myristoylation and palmitoylation. Okay, right. So, the overall outcome of this is that you've got these long chain carboxylic acid tails pointing out. Now, what will happen is those will uh, implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So, if we draw the phospholipid by there, just as two lines. So this represents the outer leaflet here. Outer leaflet. And this represents the inner leaflet here. Inner leaflet. Whoops. Inner leaflet. Okay, then what you'll basically have is these palmitoyl and myristoyl groups uh, implanting into the uh, hydrophobic core of this phospholipid by there and they will attach the NOS3 enzyme now to the membrane. Okay, so that's how you get targeting of the NOS3 enzyme. It's one of the ways you get targeting of the NOS3 enzyme to uh, the uh, membrane of the cells. Okay, so now what we want to discuss is that 
it's not just targeted to any old bit of the membrane, it's actually targeted to very specialized structures within the membrane called caviolae. Okay, now caviolae are an example of a subset of specialized structures in the phospholipid bit by there known as lipid rafts. So basically, all caviolae are uh, lipid rafts, but not all lipid rafts are caviolae. So a caviolae, or a caviolus, um, uh, singular, um, is basically a specialized type of lipid raft. So let me tell you about what a lipid raft is then. Okay, so, so far I've discussed this structure of the phospholipid by there, where we've got these phospholipids, just loads and loads of phospholipids. But basically, you can have other things apart from just phospholipids in the phospholipid pi there. And a lipid raft is basically a portion of the phospholipid pi there, a portion of the cell membrane, which contains a huge amount of these other things that you can put in there. And they tend to aggregate together. So they tend not to just evenly distribute homogeneously in the whole cell membrane. Instead, they all aggregate into these great uh, raft structures in the phospholipid by there. So if I show this, let's draw a um, flat sheet of cell membrane. So let's say this is a sheet of cell membrane. Cell membrane. Okay, then most of it will consist of phospholipids all over the place, basically. But um, you also have these other other molecules in the phos or in the cell membrane. Now, what does not occur? What does not occur is that these other molecules, which I'll denote as little coloured dots, they do not just distribute homogeneously in the phospholipid by there. This does not occur, basically. This would be a homogeneous distribution of these other molecules. And I'll tell you about what these other molecules are. So this would be a homogeneous distribution. Now, basically, this is not what happens. Instead, what happens is, if we draw another sheet of cell membrane down here, Instead, what happens is you get these huge, great clusters of these molecules together. So they all cluster together, and you get large portions of the membrane that have an extremely high uh, amount of this, um, uh, well, quantity of this other, these other molecules. And these structures in the cell membrane where you have very high density of these other molecules, those are known as lipid rafts. And caviolae are a special type of lipid raft, okay? So, let me discuss what these other molecules are, then we'll understand what a lipid raft is, and then finally we'll discuss what a caviolae is, how you modify a normal lipid raft to turn it into a caviolae. Okay, but we'll just continue this discussion in the next video.